Namaste, Dhanavad Pranam. We are here today to discuss chapter two of Idols of the Mind versus True Reality by Sripad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj. And the second chapter is the same name as the book, Idols of the Mind versus True Reality. Last week we read uh, this chapter in full, and now today we're just going to be discussing. Um, there are many many topics to be discussed from this chapter. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, what comes up. So now I'm just gonna address any of the participants. Um, we're very happy to be here today. Project Gopal Prabhu, Dr. Therese, Damayanti Didi. Whenever uh, Project Gopal Prabhu is here, we're always remembering how when he went to go see Srila Bhakti Sundar Govinda, Dev Goswami Maharaj, uh, in the in the company of Srila Bhakti Niskam Shanta Maharaj, they um, Raja Gopal asked to Srila Govinda Maharaj. He said, Maharaj, I'm, I'm currently engaged in the scientific seva under Sri Pad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj in New Jersey. Is that okay? And then Srila Govinda Maharaj, for those yes. who don't know, Srila Govinda Maharaj. Uh, is the successor of Srila Sridhar Maharaj. Prabhu, it would be much better if you just tell the story than me, yes, <laughs> if you like. Yeah, actually, we in, in, uh, actually, if I remember, it's like uh, in 2010 or sometime around. So we went to Navadvip for the first time, Parikrama, on the invitation of uh, uh, Shanta Maharaj. He's at the time, he's known as Shushen Das, okay? So actually, we used to take some classes from Madhapuri Maharaj, and uh, we we went to Navadvip, and uh, and after completing this parikrama, we went to Govinda Maharaj, and Govinda Maharaj, uh, many uh, there some uh, survivors are there. They are not actually allowing us to uh, have darshan of Govinda Maharaj. So we we are very sad and returning back from that uh, uh, temple. And uh, suddenly, Govinda Maharaj is coming by the car and saw Saz. And uh, she and uh, Maharaj told, like, come inside. And uh, luckily, we got that. Uh, and we again went to have uh, Darshan of Govinda Maharaj. And uh, I felt like uh, after seeing Govinda Maharaj, all my, uh, like, I felt like some kind of uh, the hairs are all <laughs> standing on my and like some feelings, I got some some kind of feel. And uh, he's asking me what what is your name, everything. And I told uh, presently along with Shanta Maharaj, and uh, I'm here, sir. We are uh, taking guidance from Puri Maharaj. And I asked him what can I do, what uh, what can I do because we are we actually involving in the scientific programs, and uh, and we are serving Shanta Maharaj. In his scientific mission here in uh, India, uh, so we, we I told like that, and he told, uh, okay, uh, I asked what kind of service I can do for you, uh, Maharaj. Then he told, okay, you uh, just serve Puri Maharaj. It means he is telling like uh, uh, to continue to do services in scientific seva. He told. I, th I think many people can't understand, but uh, that must be continued, scientific seva. So preaching to scientists, we need to serve uh, the people who are um, uh, doing this preaching. At least if, if I'm not, I'm not a scientist actually. So at least we must uh, do some services to the people who are uh, doing this scientific preaching. So from that, again, I told this same to Madhapuri Maharaj about my visit to uh, Govind Maharaj, Madhapuri Maharaj told you serve uh, Shanta Maharaj, Shushendas. <laughs> that is service. It's like it's like a parampara. Uh, I asked Govind Maharaj, Govind Maharaj told to serve Puri Maharaj. I asked again, to, I told this to Puri Maharaj, Puri Maharaj told again to do serve Shanta Maharaj. So uh, from that day onwards, I'm doing some uh, whatever services, little services to Shanta Maharaj whenever it comes to us. Hi, Prabhu. We feel very blessed to be in your association today. Are we able to have your darshan? Is it okay? Yeah, thank you. She turned. 
one more. Thank you. Jai. <laughs> Roger Gopal Prabhu Ki Jai. Uh, Prabhu, I know you said you're not a scientist. Uh, do you mind speaking a little bit about what you do professionally? Is that okay? Oh, it's frozen. Prabhuji, are you asking something? Yes, I think we froze for a moment. Um, you mentioned that uh, you're not a scientist yourself, but I was wondering uh, if you can just briefly mention what is it that you do uh, professionally? Professionally, I'm a software engineer. Uh, I will code some softwares in office and do some kind of stuff like that. And I will teach online also. My, whatever software I know, I will teach online and do some coding and design some uh, intranet in enter enterprise websites. Hmm. I will do something like that. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, that would pronounce. Well, Prabhu, you were about to say something? Yeah, so <clears throat> after uh, 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 after having some association with Shanta Maharaj, uh, he used to teach us some little scientific things. And I also got interested in that, actually. So, uh, and uh, also while meeting with uh, Puri Maharaj, also he used to tell a few things. Uh, so I got a little bit interested in that scientific uh, things related to uh, this devotional service. Yeah. Damayanti yeah. Didi, do you mind introducing yourself? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, sure, sure. So about me, I'm a software engineer. I did my engineering from uh, uh, from Pune University. It's in India. And then I did my PG in international business from Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. And then I did my project management from University of London. So that's the thing which I've been doing. And I was quite aggressive about my profession. There was a time I was quite ambitious. So I, when I was in Dallas, uh, I traveled throughout the uh, India because my dad was in army. So yeah, so he fought for many wars, like we had Kurgil war and he had many gallantry awards. So throughout India, I was traveling with him and I was like never into devotion, but my father, my mother was uh, more into spirituality. She used to take us to the temple and uh, my father was okay whenever there's occasion, then he used to take us. So it was like that, uh, but uh, turning point came in my life. Uh, when I was traveling throughout everywhere, I realized that there is something which is like, I'm not satisfied. Though I was getting good position, good money, but somewhere I was not satisfied. So my father asked me that you should get married. Maybe that's the thing which can help you out. Hmm. So, okay. So I came back to India and I got married. And uh, after that, <laughs> things turned, even still I was not satisfied. Still something was still missing. So my, <laughs> my father was the only one because my mother expired uh, just uh, when I was doing my engineering. So he was saying, what is the issue? I said, somewhere I'm, I, don't, I don't feel happy. I don't, I don't know what I want. Then he said, okay, maybe you should go for a child. <laughs> I said, okay. So I had a child. Uh, after that also, I was feeling that things are increasing. I'm getting more attached. So it's, not, it's still not helping me. So somewhere, um, and as you grow in your family, I was very frustrated with a lot of responsibilities from in-law side, from the kids side, and especially from the job also. Everything was so demanding for me. Then being a lady and being an Indian lady, you have to be very tolerant here because if you show your anger in the family, no one accepts here. They would say, oh, there's a problem with, they'll just go and complain your father that your daughter is not behaving. So it was very difficult for me being tolerant at the same time, you know, uh, following all the responsibilities. Then I said, how should I get this tolerant part? You know, how should I begin? Because around me, everything is, um, is not that easy. It was not easy as when my father was there to help me out. When, when my mother was there to help me out. 
So I thought what I should do. Then, <laughs> um, then um, once uh, Bhakti Shanta Maharaj, he came to a house and uh, he asked my husband that uh, you should introduce so you should introduce chanting to your wife. So then I started asking him, what is the help of chanting? How, I mean, how it's going to help me? I mean, uh, so he said, no, you start chanting. And uh, before chanting, I used to eat non-veg. I was not a pure vegetarian. I used to have a normal food because my dad was in army. So been traveled everywhere. So it was like that. But uh, after chanting, uh, I mean, I don't know. Somewhere or other, uh, when the Maharaj did my initiation, I could not eat non-veg because the moment I was eating non-veg, I was having kind of headache. I mean, this happened with me. I don't know about others, but this happened with me. I could not eat it. So, and I could not uh, have anything, you know. In fact, uh, my friends, uh, they were like, you're quite young. Why don't you go for pavos? No, I start losing interest. And I started more towards law. So that was my thing. In fact, uh, yeah. So the moment he did my initiation, things were, I was more attached to. And when I started doing the things which he told me, I started feeling satisfied. I never have this hunger, you know, I want this or that. In profession wise, I was never satisfied because I wanted a position. I would never get it because some or other person will come on the top of it and I will feel frustrated. And family time also, it used to be like my mother-in-law, she would be comparing me with some or other ladies or, you know, it's always there. So I used to feel it's very difficult to satisfy people around you. So then, but this spirituality helped me, you know, because even doing all responsibilities for parents, for kids, for your siblings, I never got that kind of happiness, which I got it while doing this devotional service. And um, yeah, so that's how it is. So in fact, around me, things are still same, but I get this happiness through this devotional service. So that is nice. my thing. Yes, actually, um, Shupad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj, when he first came to devotional life, um, he was also having non-veg and he came to the temple in Washington, D.C. after uh, he was doing postdoc work as a quantum chemist in Washington, DC. And he had some prashad, first time he ever had prashad, some banana milk and a ladu, I think. Uh, no, no, it was halva, some banana milk and halva. And from that moment, he completely just gave up being uh, non-veg because somehow the prashadam really affected him in a very deep way, like you, Damayanti Didi, the prashad somehow spontaneously changed him. And that was his own direct experience also, like you. So. It's very wonderful to hear the pastimes of the devotees, all the, how the Lord is having his pastimes through the devotees. And uh, by the grace of uh, Srila Bhakti Niskam Shanta Maharaj, we're able to have association with such uh, nice devotees who are coming to devotion, not just from some sentimental side, but for some true uh, attraction to cultivating devotion in a very a comprehensive way. That's the idea behind what we're doing with uh, the scientific Sankirtan, uh, why we are participating in it, uh, because it, it gives a very uh, well, all-rounded, well-rounded, uh, fulfilling way for us to engage in devotion. Uh, so we can engage our mind, our body, our words, our heart, everything as directed, as uh, guided by those devotees like Shripad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj, Shri Bhakti Niskam Shanta Maharaj. So we feel very blessed to have your association here. Um, so, you know, okay, Shiva, can yes. you tell a little bit about how you got started? I think, I don't know if everybody has heard your story. Can you give us a little bit about that? Okay. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm Krishna Keshava's mom, so I'm always very <laughs> proud of the work he's doing with Puri Maharaj and Shanta yeah. Maharaj and Muni Maharaj. Uh, yeah. And he's been doing this devotional service now for four, four and a half years. That's and okay. um, I love uh, for him to share his story. It's not so necessary, but basically I was practicing some yoga for health and uh, some, some friend from that same community brought me to the Princeton Bhaktivedanta Institute. Uh, and I met Maharaj, and 
uh, I went to the office a few times to hear from him. And one time he just, he looked at me and he said, come back. And I couldn't not listen to him. I had to come back. And, uh, and he, he offered me the opportunity for more service. And I felt that it was the most important thing I could do. Uh, and so I had to try to give myself fully to that. And it's only possible by the grace of the devotees and also from the very uh, wonderful and loving support. I have, you know, as she explained, my mother, she's always been very supportive in uh, everything I, I did in my life, including trying to become the servant of the servant of Krishna. Still, she was supportive. So she's also, I'm thinking, a transcendental person. <laughs> um, but, you know, today we are here specifically um, to discuss this last, the second chapter. So I'd like to just ask if there are any points for discussion. So um, I love uh, the part where you were saying that, or uh, Puri Maharaj was saying mm -hmm. that science is the perspective of nature as it appears to humans. Mm -hmm but nature is by itself and for itself as it is its true reality and i think that um we put our perspective on things and think that's the true reality but that's just our perspective and so i totally love this statement and i love the fact that um that uh Puri maharaj is uh sharing that with us because I believe, I believe, again, here I am putting my perspective. How can we speak without putting our perspective on things? But I believe that we do speak from our perspective, but it's not necessarily reality. Nature is nature. We are one with nature, but we don't, uh, uh, we affect nature in what we do, but we don't, we're not in charge. <laughs> nature's in charge <laughs> you know it's it's it is a bigger it's bigger than us we aren't in control and uh so i find it it's difficult to have people understand that because they think they're in control right so um but i i think true reality is nature itself and we are a part of it so I just want to hear what other people's perspective, again, perspective, because we can only speak from that, is on, on that kind of thinking. Um, so I thought I'd start with that. Very nice. Does anyone have anything to offer to that? Um, the one thing I can just briefly say is that you bring up a very excellent point um, about how can we speak about a perspective other than our own? But that is um, possible. And that is what spiritual science is about, right? The whole materialistic worldview is that we are locked in to the self-centered finite perspective. But the whole idea of what is spiritual life, what is cultivating a relationship with the infinite as a finite being is that when we can recognize that we are a part of the infinite and then we can learn how to tap into the way the infinite is revealing itself by and for itself means for its own purposes and by its own means and how we fit into that. We are not just a third party looking on at that. We are a part of that. Mm -hmm. So, but that decenters, like we had that one little graph in the second chapter, right? Where there was a, a circle with a dot in the middle. And then there was a line connecting that dot to another circle with a different dot in the middle. I'm gonna bring it up. I'm gonna share the screen where basically it's showing that you have to move from self-centered perspective to an absolute centered perspective because that is more reasonable. We know we, we can't control everything. We know that 
even if we try to, as Damayanti Didi was saying before, we'll be constantly be unfulfilled. We'll try so many things, but it will never be enough. So then what? <clears throat> so then what's the what's the next reasonable step, right? We're, we're, we, if you can see the picture, we think we're here in the center and we're trying to do so many things, have a good career, have a good family life, have kids, try to make more pursuits, be more successful. And we may even be able to do some of those things, but still we're not getting that fulfillment that we know must be there because we can recognize it by its lacking. Why, why do we want to be fulfilled if we can't actually be fulfilled, right? So it must be possible to be fulfilled because we already are experiencing it and it's negative. We're experiencing the desire for it, but we can't actually get that because we, we haven't gone about the right way. <laughs> so this graph that Sri Padpuri Maharaj has put is showing we have to start from this. This has to be the starting point where we don't think we're in the center and everything is to serve our own purposes. We have to recognize from the very beginning that we are a part of a greater whole that is serving the, the pleasure of a different center, that is serving the purposes of a different center. And that has to be the starting point of everything. So then, so before I go on, I mean, if, if, please, if, if there's any other contributions from anybody else. Maharaj explains in this chapter that a part of the practical, concrete way of recognizing the activity of us being a part of a greater whole is thinking itself, the activity of thinking. Uh, Rene Descartes and his philosophy, R Rene Descartes is a Western philosopher who is known to be the father of modernism, of the whole modern period that we're currently in. Rene Descartes is known to be the father of this period um, among other individuals. And his, one of his main ideas was, I think, therefore I am. And this is a mistake because he's thinking, I think, he's thinking thought is coming from the I. He, he's, uh, his understanding is that thought is coming from him. But then Maharaj raises the very valid point. If it is really us doing something, then we have to be able to explain how we're doing it. If we are the origin of our thought, when did we start thinking? Why did we start thinking? And we can't answer those things. We were merely born into an experience where thought was already taking place. When we go to sleep, thought is still taking place. We're dreaming. So these are, we cannot control that. We can't just shut that off, turn it on. We can influence it to some extent. We can, you know, we can educate ourselves in a certain way. We can try to reject certain thoughts and embrace other thoughts. So we have some relationship with thinking. We have some influence, but we definitely are not the origin of it and we can't control it. So then when we have some humility and we turn to these very wise individuals who have some, uh, have these sages from both the East and the West, they're telling us how thought is the activity, the self activity of God, of the absolute, coming to know God's self. This is coming from Plato, from Hegel and Plato, from the Greeks, also coming in the Vedas. Krishna is for himself. Krishna is pleasing himself through his energies, through the devotees, through his uh, paraphernalia, pastimes. These are all parts of Krishna. These are all energies of Krishna, but they're different from Krishna simultaneously. So there's this principle of identity and difference or unity and diversity, which is a little contradictory to the normal way that we've been conditioned to think. The normal way that we've been conditioned to think is things are mostly different from each other. We recognize the differences, we make judgments about those differences, and then whatever does not serve our self-centered purposes, we forget about. 
whatever does serve our self-centered purposes, we embrace and we continue to try to, you know, dive into those differences and reject or accept things based on our own whims. But we're complete in science, modern science has taken that approach. This is why we have some atomic idea of reality that ultimately everything is atoms and molecules, despite what we see in our immediate experience, that things are happening for a reason, that there is an exchange of love between many different life forms, that there is purpose behind their development and their living activity. Modern science says that's all just an illusion of what is really underlying uh, what's happening. And what is really happening is atoms and molecules are interacting with each other randomly through random processes and that the entire universe has come about by a big explosion. So even though the solar system is operating in a very methodical, rational way, and the activities on planet Earth of all the living organisms are happening in a very rational way, four seasons, right, continuously, birth, growth, death, all these very systematic processes, that all happened from a big explosion is the idea that's given. But again, <laughs> if we don't just accept what is you know, given by the masses and those who are accepted as authoritative, when have we ever seen an explosion produce a rational system? When have you ever seen a bomb produce a piece of architecture? Rather, it destroys the architecture, right? It, a bomb, a, an explosion destroys what is a rational working system, right? Explosive, chaotic things don't create rational working systems, it destroys them. So how is the idea that the beginning of the universe is some chaotic explosion, so to speak, a big bang. And then, then, then further, that life, as Richard Dawkins says, is life is a happy accident, right? Some non-living matter spontaneously became life. And that life over millions of years evolved into many different forms. And the only way we can actually explain this and get people to believe us is if we say it took millions and billions of years for this to happen and it's not something we can actually observe you just have to believe us it took millions of years <laughs> that's not science actually right that's a dogma life has never been produced from non-living matter in the laboratory not once a scientist named craig ventner has done these uh some, some experiments where they edit the genome of a cell and they can, they can edit the, the DNA and the genes, but that's not creating life. And they acknowledge that because the press tried to say that they created life from scratch and they were humble and honest enough to admit, no, we didn't create life from scratch, right? That can't happen. Life can only come from life. But science is advanced enough to be able to then uh, tamper with that living organism once it's alive, right? And, and so that's the basis for a lot of medical and technological advances to some extent, is how to then tamper with the activity of that living thing, but it's never come close to actually creating a living thing. And that is the only, th that is the one thing that needs to be demonstrated if any of what they say about the origin of life being non-living matter is true. They have to be able then to create that any life, a blade of grass, a cell, but they can't do any of that. So throughout this chapter, Maharaj is then making this distinction between idols of the mind versus true reality, right? All these different theories are concoctions, idols of the mind. They're coming from a finite thinker, from a finite perspective, but they're making no effort to try to come into accordance with more universal understanding, more universal uh, reason. 
which is directly experienced in our day-to-day -day activities, as well as observed throughout nature. Scientific development that goes in that direction, which is more universal, which is something that is uh, true from many different scales of reality, from our experienced scale directly, the macroscopic scale, and microscopic scale when we can look at cells also. So true reality means that we're learning more about cognition, cognitive science, and that is starting to develop actually, or right? even cellular cognition. We had one talk with cellular biologist, Brian Ford, who has been engaged with uh, cognitive biology and the cellular uh, cognizant activity. And when scientists start to take uh, that kind of activity seriously, what is life in, an, in a non-irreducible sense? What is the uh, intrinsic activity of that life? Cognitive activity, thinking, thinking, feeling, willing. And how do we observe that? And, and then how does that develop? What kind of conclusions can we draw from that? This is uh, science developing in a more comprehensive sense of true reality rather than just positing many idols of the mind and trying to validate them with some aggressive dogmatic approach. So in general, that's what this chapter uh, dealt with. And Maharaj gave many very concrete examples and gave some much, uh, some philosophical basis for us to really start to scientifically, systematically, and rationally come to see uh, how this has been developing already and how we can participate in that and, and align our own knowledge with that, align our finite perspective with that and how we can contribute to that development. That's the idea that's been presented in this chapter. It's actually the longest chapter in the book and as we said before, it's the same name as the title of the book. It, it really gives, I think, the essence of the book. So it's very important. Even if, um, like, um, even if you uh, maybe didn't get the opportunity to listen to our reading, if you can maybe speak to what are some of the principles that you have picked up on uh, in your association with the scientific Sankirtan. I know uh, Gol Palprabhu has you know, contributed to lots of Shanta Maharaj's scientific preaching and Damianti Didi, I know you uh, gave a presentation at the Science and Scientists Conference last year. Uh, so if you can just speak to how, maybe what you have learned uh, through the scientific uh, Sankirtan and how that has influenced your thinking in, in a, just a sincere or genuine way, you know, just so we, Yeah, just give me two minutes. Yeah, yeah. I'll just say, yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, actually, here many people tell us, like, uh, if we want to survive, we need to, uh, we, we must be strong and we must make other people, uh, like, survival of the fittest, like, in general society. But actually, this bhakti is like, is used uh, like we must cooperate here with each other, not like animals. We must, it's like not survival of the fittest. It, it will not apply to our uh, humans here. So, but still, some of the humans are most of the humans are doing that only survival of the fittest here because wherever we go, some competition will be there. So, for the high position or something, it's not like cooperating with each other, it's not working. Around like that. That's why that is going against our, uh, the nature and uh, we, are get, we are getting some uh, you know, bad reactions. 
because because of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Because of many many nowadays the studies also in, 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 they are encouraging this Darwin theory. Uh, so recently in India they have removed this Darwin theory from NCRT textbooks. So, but previously most of the children are influenced by this Darwin theory. Darwin theory always says survival of the fittest or something. So you must be always uh, be competition with other people. So that is against nature, right? So that is not actual uh, humans. We need to be like that. We must cooperate with each other and we need to live here. So the animal philosophy they are teaching actually, not human philosophy in the schools. They are teaching animal philosophy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that will that will not take anywhere uh, the, uh, to us. That is, that is actual uh, human philosophy they must teach. But animal philosophy because of that, because many people are behaving like that only nowadays. So the world is going in that way. And when we meet uh, Vaishnavas or some saints, we will get knowledge on how we must behave like here. What, what I, I felt like that while I'm with, with Shanta Maharaj or with Puri Maharaj. Uh, previously, I used to like behave, think like we, we need to be competitive or something like that. And it's like a, a very uh, different thinking by me now. After meeting them, my, my, my thinking changed actually. Hi, Prabhu. Thank you. Uh, shall I say my experience? So Please. I learned, yeah. So what I learned from Maharaj was like um, what I was doing earlier before meeting him. It was not helping me. Though I was very ambitious, I was getting whatever I was, but the, there is not happiness. And what I realized to survive in material life, you say that it is the survival of the fittest. I also believe like this, like we used to compete with each other. The moment I used to compete with each other, the thing is in any profession, if you're competing against someone, Okay, uh, and you want to move ahead, you have to prove that you are better than that person. Even if that person is better, you would try to do any hook and crook to prove yourself better if you want to move ahead. So in that case, you would do some damage maybe to that person. And in that way, um, <laughs> when you start chanting, it started affecting my consciousness because I realized I heard this person though I'm at higher position than him or her, but then internally I was not very happy because in this world, everywhere you got to be cheated uh, in the profession. I'm just talking about maybe there are other things. I'm just giving an example with my profession. So the moment when I'm going up, there are a lot of people around me. So they also want to reach that position. And when you reach that, you would try to manipulate, you would try to play games so that you could be ahead of that. So with the chanting, <laughs> I realized I'm not able to play that game because my consciousness was not allowing. If that person is doing better and he deserves better than me, then okay, let it be. Maybe Krishna wants that. So what I learned is like, I have to do my karma with 100% with my satisfaction instead of harming others. If other is doing, that is their thing. But if still the other person, and then even when I was doing my 100%, other person will cheat. He'll try to move, oh, she hasn't done this, or try to take the credit of your work and will try to move ahead of you. We'll get more promotion and I was denied. Oh, I, he will take your credit. So at that point, I was not very sad because I realized that, okay, I have given my 100% and I'm happy. Okay, if Krishna wants me to give this position, he'll give me. If he doesn't want, he'll not. But at the end of the day, I have many examples in my profession. So Maharaj told me that I was very sad. I was doing my project and this guy, he took the whole thing and he just said, I'm doing it. And uh, 
she did not do anything because I did not have a very good connection with the higher authorities. And he was saying, being a lady, you know, she was not very, but he made all excuses. I was quite hurt because I was putting a lot of effort and all that. I called up Maharaj. I said, Maharaj, this guy has cheated me. He took all the credit and he's being promoted. And I'm quite lower at this. And Maharaj told me, see Damianti Didi, in this world, in material world, it's like there are two people. One is who is cheating and the other one who is getting cheated. So he told me this. So the thing is, I said, then how should I go up? So he said, see, first thing is you have to give your 100%. And if Krishna wants, he will give you. If he doesn't want, he'll not. Because ultimately everything works as per Krishna's uh, instruction. Or he told me in the past life, maybe you would have done same to him. So you would never know what you have done in your past life. So there are many lives, there are many forms. So you are just talking about this form. But could be in a past life, you would have done something to him. Or that is why. So he explained me a lot of things. But at the end, he said, uh, you have to be tolerant. You have to be hardworking. And I said, I get angry, you know. So he said, anger is, you know, anger is the worst thing. It can sabotage you. The mind does not work if you're angry. He told me. And he told me the moment you get anger, I'll tell you the story of a sadhu. He told me a very nice story of a sadhu. So sadhu was meditating. And the guys, they come and throw, uh, used to throw shit on him all the time. And then that sadhu will go again, take bath. And then again, the guys, they were small children. They'll again take the shit, uh, shit and throw it on him. So it was like continuously, this thing was going. And I said, then ultimately what happened? Then he said, see, this is the process of bhakti that you will keep getting cheated, but you need to be tolerant at times. And ultimately you'll get, the things what you want so because i've seen the people those who were playing games at the time they got tired of and they just back off they said oh this thing is not working on her or something so same thing so he told me the first principle which was very important being tolerant and he said you should be out of anger the moment you feel that i'm angry or this thing you have to come out of it because it's going to sabotage you it's going to sabotage your mind. It's going to sabotage everything. So those are the two things which he told me about the frustration. You need to be patient. And other thing, uh, when I was doing devotional service, I used to get distracted, you know, because we used to meet families. We used to go out. A lot of things were there. But then he told me, uh, I said, Maharaj, I'm not getting enough time for, you know, all these activities. And he told me one thing. See, Jiva has limited energy. Either you can serve Lord, and how do you satisfy Lord? You work, you work for the Lord. I'm doing my work for the Lord. If he wants, he'll give me uh, the return of it. Maybe he can give me um, a good promotion. He'll give me good salary, whatever. Or if he wants, it's only, so you just work for that. And so that helped me. And other thing, I was also uh, in between my kid health was not well. So I said, oh, Maharaj, she's not doing well and all that. I don't know. So he said, you try to make her a devotee. When you make her a devotee, Krishna will take care of her. So though she was going through that tough phase, but I made her all, you know, my in-laws, they used to give her eggs and all that. So I had to fight. I said, no, I want to make her a devotee. And I used to give her all vegetarian diet. And I used to take her to the temple regularly, making her read Narsim Harti and all that. And it actually helped her health. So I realized that when you start working for Krishna, you know, when you're working, he'll take care of your things. Mm. So yeah so for me you know so uh yes so not mm -hmm. all in fact for my family members those who are not keeping well i keep telling them that you become a devotee krishna will take care of you but it becomes difficult to convince everyone but that's what i've seen in my life so i apply two three principles of him first is being tolerant anger free and being humble he always told me that you have to humble and I said, you know, this person is very rude at times, maybe in a family, not talking well. He said, let, the, let them be. But you, the way you talk, you know, it should be always, you know, you give them respect. If they are doing that, you say, okay, you are great. You are this and that. I'm very small. 
he used to tell me like that and it actually helped me those people i can tell you that why because i've been practicing from last 7 years those people who were you know just showing me off all the time putting me down whether in profession or they just came to me later on in their life and they apologized me and they asked me okay what are you doing they used to make fun of the things oh you are doing this or oh, it's not going to work and later on when it worked they were like i mean maybe they have ridiculed that point of time but later on they said no we know that you do your best so this is when i heard i said this thing works in this life and so and making everyone devotee is also one of the best thing so i realized that krishna will take care of because i've seen with my own kid when she was completely unwell and i was in a very bad state you know when it comes to our kid then the things changed because that was the thing and i realized making her devotee really helped me yeah well, so yeah i'm remembering duty when you were saying like this uh one thing from bhagavatam uh, that i heard from shripad puri maharaj is there is a verse that tells about what is our actual ontological position in relation to krishna and it's like a tree that krishna is the roots of the tree and we are like the leaves so when we are giving all our time and energy to trying to water ourselves we're putting water on the leaves and the flowers of the tree actually that's not even how a tree works we can give so much time and energy to trying to water the trees the leaves on the tree but that will just be a waste of our energy it will become in a state of suffering but when you put all your time and energy when you put all the water on the root of the tree which is krishna you put all your water on the root of the tree then just the way that the tree works is everything else will get taken care of then all the flowers will bloom so in that way how we can water the roots how we cannot give everything to krishna how we can remember krishna and of course the most practical way is that we're uh, told is our service to uh, the vaishnavas and in the context of what is shri pad bhakti madhava puri maharaj doing shri bhakti nishkam shanta maharaj the uh, helping with these programs learning uh, the philosophy that is being talked about uh, helping with the conferences like that these are the practical ways of engaging in service I mean, it doesn't mean renounce everything, right? Srila Sri Ram Maharaj made perfectly clear that we are not interested in the plane of exploitation, but we're also not interested in the plane of renunciation. We're not trying to give everything up. That's not our. That's not our game. Um, we are trying to get, engage in the plane of dedication. Everything that the Lord has given us in this lifetime, it's not for our enjoyment, and it's not to give up. It's to use for his enjoyment, everything. So as much time and energy as we can put into giving everything to Krishna through the Vaishnavas. And, and that means actually like having connection with them on a regular basis and, and trying to learn, well, how can I contribute based on whatever my life circumstances are? How can I contribute practically? And that is what we're trying to do here. Uh, that's what we're trying to do with this book study in a very humble way. And only by Krishna's grace and the blessings of the devotees uh, can we be successful in our endeavor. Can we be successful in remembering Krishna and in, in serving his, uh, his devotees and remembering uh, uh, to be as humble as possible, to not be attached to the result of our actions all these things it's only possible if if he you know gives his grace otherwise we're incompetent cannot do anything <laughs> and uh, we feel that we have received some of krishna's grace today because we are here in the association of the vaishnavas and um we, you know we feel very blessed and we hope that um, next sunday we can continue to uh, engage in these activities uh, with you all and if there are any last comments uh, or questions, otherwise we can uh, close for today. No? So first, just giving our uh, glorifying the Vaishnavas, Vansha Kalpa, Chayu Bhyascha, Kripa Sindhu Bhyavacha, Patitanam Pavane Bhyo, Vaishnave Bhyo, Namo Nama. And giving our respects to our spiritual masters. Om Gyana Timirin Hasya, Gyananjana Shalakaya, Shakshro Udmilitan Yenatasmai Shri Gurave Nama.
ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਵਾਪਸ ਨਾਮ